Please welcome the creator of the Swift programming language and the founder of Modular AI, Chris Latner. He's talking with Cerebral Valley co-host, Max Child. All right, Chris, well, great to have you here. Um, I think you have one of the most amazing kind of work histories in all of technology and all of AI. So, you know, you've gone from, from Apple to Tesla to Google to now starting your own company. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, you know, your perspective on that story and, and what brought you from, you know, big companies, programming languages to today. Yeah. Well, so th thank you, Max. I guess my journey started as a developer. Right, so I love programming, love coding, love the process of creating things. And so at Apple, I rose through the ranks and learned a lot and ended up leading the entire developer tools ecosystem there, which was huge, fantastic, a tremendous journey. That included the Swift programming language and a bunch of other things that you know, started as a night and weekends project. So, so Swift is on every single iPhone in the audience, every Mac in existence. Yeah. I mean, how many people have used you know, a, a program that has written partially or wholly in Swift. Yeah, which is super cool, right? And so to me, it's about empowering developers and getting people to be able to create things, which is about accessibility, about cool technology, but it's about making it available to lots of people, right? Around 2016, I fell in love with this weird, obscure thing that I thought was promising called AI. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that obscure, but more obscure than uh, today, maybe. I yeah, don't know. well, so that, let's just say that was pre chat GPT. All right, right. pre chat GPT AI. <laughs> so, it was a nothing. And I was unable to convince Apple folks at the time that this was a thing. Uh, yeah, that may or may not have paid off so, for them in the end. I, I don't, don't know. know, but um, <laughs> uh, we won't go there. But, the, uh, <laughs> but went on kind of this hero's journey of trying to understand what this is. And so that's where Tesla doing applied work. Google Brain doing infrastructure work, built the TPU stack, launched it in cloud, got this novel accelerator heterogeneous compute thing was really exciting and interesting. Okay. And then and then build into this and realize that like this is really fundamental. There's so much cool that's evolving in the research side and everything else. But it's really about the developer. I have to say, you know, I'm I'm a startup founder myself, but I never worked at all these large companies. I have to say it takes a lot of guts to, you know, go through a lot of you know, big companies, big organizations, huge budgets, huge staff, yeah. everything to kind of strike off on your own. I'm interested, like, what gave you that impetus to finally kind of, you know, do it yourself, try yeah. to build it yourself, and, and really go after the, you know, what you yeah. see as a big opportunity well, so, with Modular? Yeah, great question. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think that many big companies are investing in the infrastructure layer, which is where we're working, mm -hmm. and they've been building lots of really cool things, and I've worked on several of them. My team's worked on all of them, I think. Oh. The challenge is, is that when your incentive is to ship a chip, when you have a thing that you've been building for the last five, six, seven, eight years, really you're incentivized to hill climb. Okay. And so you have a huge investment. Usually okay. there's a VP of that thing. Yeah. Right? There, there's you're the a VP of something. There, there's, yeah. there's a new chip coming. <laughs> there's a, you, know, you have this incentive to always take the investment and make it bigger. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very difficult to restart, mm -hmm. reconsider, mm -hmm. first principle, take what you've learned and build. And a lot of the systems that exist today, I mean, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Onyx, XLA, like all these things, they're all wonderful. They have, they're fundamental and huge contributions to the world, but they're almost 10 years old. These weren't built for Gen AI. Yeah. These weren't built for LLMs. These haven't been predicting what AI looks like today. And mm -hmm. as a consequence, a lot of what we're seeing in the world is a lot of suffering, right? And it's suffering in... <laughs> you mean developer suffering. Developers. Okay, it's right, about right. production, <laughs> production expense. It's about deploying AI into products. Okay. And so the research side is one thing, but the suffering, I think, is what really motivates me. <laughs> All right, that's a, that's a pretty good sound bite. Um, so yeah, I mean, I want to step back for a second what you're working on in Modular today. Um, you know, we've talked a lot all throughout the, the day at Cerebral Valley of like, all the layers of the AI stack, right? From you know the chips, you know through all the kind of middleware layers, you know all the way to the model building up to the final, you know end user applications, yep. the chat GPTs, et cetera. Like, what pieces of the stack, you know, are you digging into at Modular? Are you really yeah. focused on? How did you choose those, and, and how did you decide they were an exciting opportunity for a company? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, many different pieces there. So yeah. I love all of these things. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, all right. But so you had to choose some. Exactly. So okay. as a nerd, like I can be a fan of all of these different things. And okay. I'm, I'm not. A, a credible AI researcher. I spent a long time in the compilers, the systems, the tools, the hardware software boundary. And so to me, I think that the thing that I naturally gravitate towards is how do we enable people to use more hardware? Okay. How do we enable more innovation in the hardware? How do we unlock the creativity of people that don't actually want to know how the hardware works, okay. but they depend inherently on high performance, scalable, distributed, multi-cluster, thousand nodes, like all this fancy stuff that's happening. Yeah. 
Yet nobody wants to know about it. Okay. So, this so your goal is to abstract all that crazy hardware in the data center that you know you buy from NVIDIA or whatever and make it easier to build great AI applications. Yeah, absolutely. And so okay. our, our approach on that then is to say, cool, there's this cool technology. There's many of these things that have been proven in many different systems. Let's, again, bring it together. First principle, build a completely new animal. Mm. So this is not an existing creature. This is a new animal. Okay. So empty Git repo build from scratch, like kind of a thing. Okay. Um, but make it so it's a drop-in compatible replacement. Okay. And so our, our tech is a drop-in replacement for TensorFlow and PyTorch and TorchScript and Onyx and all these things that people are using. Wow. But it is better performance, lower latency, more hardware availability, lots of hackability and things like this. And you decided again after Swift and earlier in your career, uh, LLVM, to create another programming language, basically. Okay. You know, did you set out to do that? Uh, if, you, if so, why? If not, you know, how did you end up doing it again? Like, how, how do you keep creating programming languages? You're, you're saying I have bad, <laughs> bad life choices. <laughs> I don't know. You seem to be falling into creating programming languages <laughs> left and right. Uh, very few people have that problem. Well, uh, so, I mean, I, I built OpenCL. I built Clang, okay, which is yeah. C++. So I'm leaving out, like, I two built, other ones. Yeah, okay. Swift, right, like, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, let's just say, like, having done that, it's not as scary. Okay, it's pretty scary to me, so. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. should do a few, I, and then it gets easier. <laughs> uh, but, but what I'd say about that is that you have a very good understanding of what matters. Okay. And when something is the right tool for the job or not. Right, and there's a lot of really bad reasons to build a programming language. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to get something that could be technically interesting that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. right? And so for us, when we started Modular, we did not design, or we were not planning on building a programming language. In okay. fact, quite the opposite, because that's a really bad idea, and I think it's <laughs> widely known you should not do that. Okay, but you did it by accident again. Well, so what we did was we built this really fancy solution for heterogeneous compute. Okay. Like, if you go back to the Can problem. Can you explain heterogeneous compute? If you yeah. go back to the problem, yeah. like, today in AI, we talk about GPUs. Right? A sure. lot of us care about GPUs, GPU stock out outages, like all these different things. How do we maximize the hundreds of million dollars that are spent on a job? Like we talk about GPUs. And that's a really important part of the problem. Mm -hmm. But then you look at the CPUs right next to it. CPUs have tensor cores. They're massively changing. There's a huge amount of diversity. They're installed everywhere. And they're really great for a different part of the problem. Right? And so to me, it's not about what, how do we use GPUs. I look at this as not the hardware problem, I look at this as a software problem. Mm. How do AI developers, this is the researchers, the production deployment engineers, the people actually trying to build this into their products, what, are they, what problem do they have? Okay. And it turns out it's a data loading, pre-processing, a lot of matrix multiplications, transformers, post-processing, networking, it's a full end-to-end -end compute problem. Okay. And nobody was tackling that problem. Okay. And so what we did was we said, okay, well we need to build a fundamentally new creature Right? It includes a lot of low-level geeky runtime and compiler and fancy algorithms and fusion and like all kinds of like <laughs> fusions. It's not 50 years from now. It's, okay. like, you know, it's, it's here right. today. Okay. Dynamic shapes, like all, the, all these cool technology things, but build it into a system that people can use. Because nobody has a compiler problem. They have a complexity problem. Okay. Like people are dealing with too many systems that don't work very well. And so what we're doing is we're building one system that actually scales and actually meets people where they are and actually helps yeah. lift people. Well, let's say like I'm either, I guess there's like two potential customers for your product, right? Yeah. Say I'm a big enterprise, you know. I'm actually, let me answer your question yes. first. Okay, yeah, yeah, is that right, okay? Right, so, right, so, yeah. so I didn't answer where, where Mojo, which <laughs> okay, is yes, programming language. Okay, yes, Mojo. So programming language, what is Mojo? Why did you build yeah. it? And why is it better than And so, people? And so we're building all this fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. Amazing, cool, low-level nerdery. <laughs> you know, it's lovable in its own way, but nobody can use it. Okay. And so then you enter this point where you say, I have this fancy, amazing technology. It's pure technology. Mm -hmm. How do I make it accessible to people? Okay. Right? And so what we did is we said, okay, look, who are our, who's our target audience? They're AI developers. What do they love? Python. Okay. They don't love C++. They don't love CUDA. They don't love, uh, I mean, some of them love Rust. <laughs> but really, it's Python. Right, and so what we did is we said, let's build the world's best Python. Okay. And so we're not building forward from building a better Python. Mm. We're building backwards from speed of the light of heterogeneous fancy accelerators and hardware and things like this. But where you meet in the middle is you say, okay, for any given device, I want to build the best thing for an NVIDIA H100 GPU, but as accessible as Python. Mm. And it needs to be fully compatible with the entire Python ecosystem. Literally, in Mojo, you can import an arbitrary Python package, one that is never seen before and just works, right? But then run at amazing performance, scale in ways, distribute, packaging, like all these problems need to be solved. And so this is where we ended up saying, Got okay, it. given what we know, this is actually not 
It's merely just really, really hard engineering work. It's not magic or, science, so, or new science. So you're saying everyone you know, loves Python, or at least there's a massive yes. industry built around Python, but Python doesn't offer you these opportunities to take advantage of all these amazing GPUs, CPUs, as you were describing. And so you're trying to build something that is, I guess, you know, in programming language, you call it a superset, but it's, it's, you know, it has Python, and then you can build on top yeah. of Python, right? It's like, it's like you can build it across was, all those. Things. Yeah, there was C, yeah. and then there was C++. Yeah, so and Python so, with more cool stuff built in. Yeah, yeah. exactly. OK, yeah. And, and again, if you, look at, if you look at the problem that AI developers have today, you want to deploy an LLM. Mm -hmm. Well, so people today are writing custom CUDA kernels. Mm. They're writing tokenization in C++, C++ or Rust or something like that. Yeah. They're designing and orchestrating and training the model in Python. Yeah. Like, how does anybody get anything done here? It's, it's actually pretty. I, not, I mean, o open AI has figured it out. I guess. AI, AI, AI people are amazingly brilliant. <laughs> they should not be spending their brain power on this. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> right? and so. um, well, yeah. Let's say, like, I'm in the audience. I'm, you know, an enterprise that has, you know, some AI model work that we've yeah. either already done or going to do. Or let's just say, like, I'm, I'm an indie startup developer. You know, and we have a small team. Like, you know, wh what is the pitch? Why should I use modular? What should I use it for? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. How do you, how do you convince people to, to start using your products? Yeah. Well, so. I mean, we, we are about to launch a major new step in our product. OK. Uh, but how about the existing one? Or, and, or? and so the existing one is really around Mojo. OK. And so Mojo, the new language. Yeah. Mojo is just a programming language. It's a member of the Python family. It is up to, like, I don't know, 84,000 times faster than Python in cherry pick benchmarks. But okay. Fast. Ran, random people on the internet see it's a 100 to 1,000 times faster. It's a lot so faster. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Python. Again, it's wonderful, it's usable, it's accessible, everybody's teams are trained in it. It doesn't like, scale very well. It's not something you want to put in production all the time, and so Mojo solves those problems. Okay. Uh, many folks have a CUDA problem. Like, CUDA is really important, but it is difficult to use, it is difficult to generalize, and things like this, and so Mojo can help with that. And so as a programming language, it's very interesting from that perspective. Okay. The thing that hasn't been announced yet, which if you're interested, December 4th, we have a nice event. You should come. Come. All right. Um, completes the loop with the AI part of it. Okay. And so Mojo plus the AI part of it is really quite interesting. And so this is where, again, it's not about any one computer. It's about this big, messy problem that we've created and we're struggling with and enabling all the development teams across the world to have superpowers. And so I think this is what people get excited about. OK. I mean, you and I spoke earlier, and you guys have raised, correct, over $100 million correctly. So you, it seems like you have a big plan. You have a sort of take over the world vision here. We're I know you're fortunate oh, people believe yeah. in us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, so you know, what, is, what is the big plan? What is the take over the world vision? You know, what, what are you spending the $100 million on? Like, what are you, what are you building yeah. towards? Well, so at Nature, the problem I have mm -hmm. <laughs> is that the, the projects that we're embarking on and the things that I like to build take time, take an amazing and significantly large development team, mm. and require building things very deliberately step by step. Okay. So I'm not the kind of person that likes to run and like have a cool demo and declare success and then doesn't <laughs> generalize. I like to build the foundational things that everybody in the world builds on top of. And so what we're spending money on is the development team. Okay. And so the world has a lot of hardware. This requires a very significant team. The technology in this space is very difficult. It's also the case that nobody wants to know about compilers. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, I love them kind of, but, um, but no users actually want to know about any of this stuff. And yeah. so if you look at a lot of the AI tech that we use, a lot of it is full of these leaky abstractions and poorly composed things. And so you have to be an expert on all of this stack. Mm -hmm. And you really just want to build on top of it. Right, and so what we're doing is we're pulling together the best people, you know, in our opinion, the best team in the world, to help build this, and it's not a small effort. But yeah. we think that it's meaningful, and we hope that it'll be useful. And, and you guys already have 150,000 developers yes. using your tools, right? Which is pretty impressive. I mean, you know, do you see that as kind of a leverage point or a takeoff point for the next generation of modular tools? I mean, I think it's it's amazing, and so we just launched just over six months ago, and I so mean, it's, that's it's, crazy uptake. It's it's pretty cool. I mean, I the way I, the way I read that is that we're tapping into deep industry problems. I mean, people have been using Python for decades now, right? And yeah. Again, we love it. We use it for so many things. It, it, Python's also not an AI thing, right? It, yeah. it, it touches everything. And so I talked with folks in high-frequency trading, for example. Okay. And they tell me, okay, well, you know, all of our analysts use Python. We can't stop them from using Python. But then I have to rewrite it to C++ to get yeah. the gajillions of queries a second that they want to deal with done. Yeah. And so their, their margin is that time to market. So you're offering them so something having, faster and better, but that yeah. they understand already. Yeah, that yeah. their teams are already trained on, that they can d develop new novel APIs and things like this. And so I think this is what gets people excited. And the fact that it 
again, it meets people where they are. It fits into their ecosystem. They don't have to retrain people, I think is also pretty, yeah. pretty useful. Well, so to, to harken back to the beginning of the conversation, I want to do a bit of a light, lightning round based on the places you've worked and the, the yeah. things you've experienced. So you worked at Apple for quite a long time. You invented you know, their fundamental programming language, as I said, on every iPhone today. I think the perception in the industry is that Apple is kind of always behind on cloud services, always behind on AI in particular. You know, I build voice-driven products. Siri gets a lot of crap. Quite, um, <laughs> quite, quite a few games. Yeah, quite a few awesome. games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, w what was your perception working at Apple? Like, yeah. you know, what or what is your perception today? Like, where do you yeah. see the Apple AI team going? Do you think they're going to catch up to the rest of the industry? Um, do you believe, you know, Siri will see a revamp? Yeah. Like, what, you know, what's your perspective on the future of Apple with AI? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, I mean, my memories are old Apple at the Sure, point. but you, you know, you know but, uh, <laughs> you've got more um, information than most of us. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> Apple's an amazing, deliberate and principled and structured group, mm -hmm. they're very strategic, right? And so they'll see a thing happening, but instead of jumping on it and hoping for a cool demo, they'll, they'll be principled and they'll move slowly, but when they do something, it's material, right? So I think the question that I ask as a, as a shareholder and as, as, <laughs> as a friend of many of the people is, yeah. will they actually ever do it, Yeah. right? Because the world <laughs> is passing them by and the technology <laughs> is proven out there and Siri is still not amazingly great. And... I can't tell you that because I don't know. Yeah, I'm we not don't know. There, but, but but I would like for them to if, figure it if out. If you were to make a prediction, would you say 2024 Siri takes a great leap forward? Like, would you take a 50/50 bet on that? Uh, yeah, I think 2024 it will take a all great right, leap 50 /50 forward. All right, 50/50 bet. All right, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, I, um, think, I think that's quite possible. So will, honor, will, it, will it solve all of the problems no, or just I mean, catch up? I think it'll catch up. Catch up is a good start. So okay, next one, like you know, Tesla. You worked uh, you worked with Elon on self-driving cars for a yes. while. I guess like. A, what was that experience like? And then B, yes. we just heard the Waymo CEO, you know, and I think that they're taking some great strides forward in self-driving. You know, what's your perception of Tesla's philosophy with respect to self-driving? And, yeah. and yeah, where, you know, how, how, how do you think they're going to win or be a winner in the self-driving race, I guess? Well, so you can be a winner at anything yeah. when you define what the term means. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, full self-driving is defined as level two autonomy, apparently, and so they're a winner. Okay, they're already winning. But yes, let, they've been let, winning let, for years now. Let's say no no driver's seat, you know, no person in the driver's seat. I've ridden in these Waymos, it's amazing. There's no one there, right? Okay, again, yeah. I have no insight in this, <laughs> but everything that it tells me is that Tesla's very happy with having drivers that buy their cars. Okay, yes, and so, so, so the robo-taxi fleet of Tesla's I, I, you don't believe I, in? I, I, it was once my job to solve full self-driving by the end of 2017. Right. That, that's, that was like last year, right? So yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not very good at my job, apparently, <laughs> but um, so we can see exactly what the claim will be next year. Well, but. When, okay, all right, I'll, I'll give you the 50-50 bet again. Like, <laughs> will a Tesla be able to drive through San Francisco, you know, as well as a Waymo in, let's say, by 2025? You know. With somebody in the with trunk nobody in the driver's seat, it? yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. Somebody in the trunk controlling it, like one of the <laughs> no, demos. No, I mean like <laughs> nobody in the trunk. Nope, the passenger doesn't have to lean over and grab the steering wheel. Like I, know, I will what? say no. I do no. not think okay. that, that right. is going to happen. Okay, I think right. Waymo is far far ahead. Okay, all right. That's I mean that's a pretty strong endorsement. Yeah. Well, I mean I guess as sort of a last question, you know, given that you know you're you're building developer tools and we have tons of developers in the audience, yeah. you know, what would your pitch to a developer for you know download modular today, pay attention to your conference. Like you know, wh why should we why should we use your products? Yeah. Why should we get excited about it? I'm not gonna like try to do a sales pitch. I mean, yeah, I, mean I think you should. that yeah, yeah. Ho <laughs> hopefully the things we build are useful. Okay. Right, and we're trying to solve problems. I think one of the things that we do is we try to do things in very deliberate steps, and we try to do it the best we can. And so what this means is that the steps we take are, I think, important. But we're always being told, go faster, do more, do more of things, do, do, do you know, solve this problem, this problem, and, and more hardware, and all this stuff, whatever it is. And so we say no or not yet. Again, this is Apple DNA, by the way. Yeah, this is like an Apple, not a Tesla approach, it seems exactly. like. Exactly, yeah. I'm not gonna overclaim. And so <laughs> if it's useful, awesome. And if it's not, tell us and we'll fix it. But what I like is I like building developers, developer bases, and that's built on trust, right? Transparency, clear communication. And so like, if you wanna ask questions, you can come to our Discord. We have 22,000 folks there like, okay. talking about stuff. And, and that's awesome, but I don't want to like say you should use it when you should not. I okay. think you can discover it for yourself. Ask your engineers what they like to use. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Chris Latner. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. yeah.